Something new and strange has happened in Canada. Canada is sitting on probably one of the largest housing bubbles of all times. Something we haven't seen before. An entire generation of youth now say they will never be able to afford a home. This is not normal for Canada. We've got students who are living in their vehicles because they couldn't find a place to live. Tens of thousands of Canadians could default, Moshe, on their mortgages. And are, are we looking at that kind of nightmare scenario? After generations of affordable and stable Canadian home prices, it now takes 66% of the average monthly income to make payments on the average single detached Canadian house. Given that most of the remaining 34% of the family paycheck is taken up by taxes, there's literally nothing left for food and recreation. And that all assumes that you have enough for a down payment to get the mortgage in the first place. Saving up for that down payment in Toronto now takes an average of 25 years. Not long ago, you paid off a mortgage in that time. So young people must rent, but rent has doubled in the last eight years. Newlyweds now pay $1,000 per month to rent a single room in a townhouse that they share with two other couples. 35-year-olds live in their parents' basements. Rents are so high in Toronto that students live in homeless shelters. Others sleep in their cars or even under bridges just to afford to go to university. One grandmother posted signs on hydro poles trying to find a place to live. Middle-class people like nurses and carpenters now live in their vehicles. Tent cities are popping up in almost every major city and many small towns in Canada, mostly in places that never had them before. And because homeless shelters are overflowing with people, new refugees are now told to live on the streets and under bridges. Now, like all countries, we've always had problems. Throughout Canada's past though, almost anyone who got a job could save up and buy a home by their mid-twenties. When did all that change? Canada's about Prime eight Trudeau. years ago. It's crazy to think, but in a little under a decade, Canada's housing costs have basically doubled. The rent has doubled. Mortgage payments doubled. The needed down payment on an average home doubled. Double trouble. Think about that. Housing costs have gone up more since 2015 than they had in all the years before that combined. Eight years ago, the average one bedroom rent was about 970 bucks. The average today, $1,871. The average needed down payment, about $23,000. Today, 51 grand. Eight years ago, the average mortgage payment was about $1,400. Now, it's over $3,500. Eight years ago, payments on an average single detached home cost roughly 40% of median family income. Now, that number is 66%, meaning that paychecks have not caught up with the cost of housing. And we can't blame the rest of the world. Canada's housing costs have risen faster and higher than almost any other country on earth. Depending on how and when you measure it, Canada's housing costs are on average 45 to 75% higher than in the United States. In border towns, it's even more. Homes on the Canadian side are often 100% more expensive than their American counterparts. Look at this home in Niagara, Canada versus this home in Niagara, New York only about a half an hour apart from one another. Vancouver is now the third and Toronto the 10th most unaffordable city on earth, worse than New York, London, England, and even Singapore, a wealthy island with 2,000 times more people per square kilometer than Canada. All these places have more money and people and less land, yet they are more affordable. UBS, a major global bank, now lists Toronto as having the riskiest housing bubble in the world, with Vancouver sixth. According to UBS, home prices in Toronto and Vancouver have gone from fair valued to overvalued to bubble risk, all in only 10 years. This two bedroom property in Toronto's Kensington neighborhood costs the same as a 20 bedroom castle situated on five acres of land in Scotland. This shouldn't be a problem in Canada based on our supply demand dynamics. Think about it. With our massive geography, meaning lots of supply, and our small population, meaning limited demand, housing should be cheap here in Canada. We have the most land per person of any G7 country. That includes much land close to big cities where people need to live to work. So why is it so expensive? 
Well, let's break it down. A mortgage payment has two parts, interest and principal. Interest rates are set by the Bank of Canada, but heavily influenced by the federal government. You'll forgive me if I don't think about monetary policy. Uh when the government borrows and spends, it bids up the goods we buy and the interest we pay. The Trudeau government has doubled Canada's debt, adding more debt than all prime ministers combined. Our finance minister has conceded that this deficit spending pours fuel on the inflationary fire. And I'm gonna start with what we shouldn't do. I think that it is very important not to make the problem worse. I am very mindful of the importance of not pouring fiscal fuel on the flames of inflation. And then, a few weeks later, she poured $69 billion of new fuel on that fire. For governments to run huge deficits or borrow money, they sell bonds to investors. In recent years, the Trudeau government's spending has exploded, and they've been borrowing more than lenders will lend. So the Bank of Canada has started creating the cash. The money supply has therefore grown eight times faster than the economy over the last three years. More money bidding on fewer goods, including fewer houses, equals higher prices. But the central bank doesn't just send a Brinks truck to the Prime Minister's office. Rather, they use a complicated set of transactions that they call quantitative easing. I always be suspicious when you hear a complicated word that makes no sense to anyone except those benefiting from it. Here's how it goes. First, the government sells bonds to financial institutions. Then, the Bank of Canada buys those bonds right back at higher prices. Financial corporations love it because they're guaranteed a big profit. But the consequence is not only that the government gets more easy money to spend, but the financial system overflows with cash which often is lent out at ultra low rates in super large mortgages, particularly for wealthy investors whose banking connections get them to the front of the line. So as you can see in this chart from the Bank of Canada itself, investors doubled the number of home purchases they made in just over a year. The black line, well, it shows when the quantitative easing began. Cause, money printing, effect, housing inflation. So the government deficits force the Bank of Canada to boost interest rates to push inflation back down. Former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley put it this way. It appears that uh, fiscal monetary policy are not aligned and the importance of that alignment is is key. We're still running very large fiscal deficits. Um, the government still talks about how much they're going to they're going to continue to spend and uh, this is a bit like driving your car with one foot on the gas and the other on the brake. Common sense solution, stop the inflationary deficits so the bank doesn't have to raise the rates. That means cutting government waste and capping government spending with a dollar for dollar law that forces politicians to find a dollar of savings for each new dollar of spending. By getting back towards a balanced budget, we'll bring down inflation, and interest rates on your mortgage payment. So that helps address the interest cost of the mortgage payment. What about the principal, which is determined by the home price? Canadian prices, which are so much higher than in other countries, are determined by supply and demand. We have the fewest houses per capita in the G7, even though we have the most land to build on. We have fewer houses per capita today than we did eight years ago, as population has outgrown home building. Canada built fewer homes last year than it built in 1972, 50 years ago. Consider this. In 1972, Canada's population was 22 million, and we built about 230,000 homes. In 2022, Canada's population was 39 million, and we built about 220,000 homes. In other words, far more people, far less home building. And the shortfall is only growing. Canada's housing agency, the CMHC, predicts a 32% drop in home building this year as higher interest rates and red tape are blocking construction. The agency projects that we will be 3.5 million homes short by the year 2030 based on our current estimates of building and population growth. Where will those 3.5 million families live? 
more importantly, why can't we build homes to house them? What do you think is the most expensive thing that goes into a new house in, say, Vancouver? Is it labor? Lumber? Land? Nope. Government. A CD House study added up all the costs of labor materials, land, and profit needed to build a home and compared it to the final sale price. In Vancouver, the gap was nearly $1.3 million. That gap, or as I call it, the gatekeeper gap, is the cost of government permit delays, changing rules, pricey consultants, lawyers' fees, charges, taxes, etc. Another study showed Montreal's city government blocked 24,000 homes. The city of Winnipeg, meanwhile, just lost a lawsuit because it tried to block the construction of nearly 2,000 homes right next to a newly built transit system. As an example of the mindless red tape costs, the Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force report stated that, quote, minimum parking requirements add as much as $165,000 to the cost of a new home, even as demand for parking spaces is falling, and that one of the strongest signs that our approval process is not working of 35 OECD countries, only the Slovak Republic takes longer than Canada to approve a building project. The UK and the US approve projects three times faster without sacrificing quality or safety. Government development charges in Ontario can be as much as $135,000 per home, and some have increased as much as 900% in less than 20 years. And those charges don't include governmental costs like taxes, delays, and uncertainty. Worst of all, the Trudeau government has encouraged this gatekeeping with billions of dollars in new grants to the same city governments that block home building. He is literally funding the hiring of more gatekeepers to stand in the way of building homes. So you lose two ways. You pay more in taxes so that you can pay more for a home. So what if we incentivized good behavior rather than reinforcing the bad? Here's how we can. The federal government spends about $4.5 billion on direct and continuous municipal infrastructure transfers. Big city politicians care about getting that money more than anything else. They'll only permit more home building faster if their federal money depends on it. My common sense plan? One, require big cities to complete 15% more home building per year as a condition of getting federal infrastructure money. Two, give building bonuses to cities that exceed the 15% target. Dollars should be based on housing completions, not promises. Three, require federally funded transit stations be permitted for high density apartments all around it and withhold federal transit grants until the apartments are built and occupied. Four, sell off 15% of federal buildings and thousands of acres of surplus federal land suitable for housing. Instead of funding promises, the federal government should fund results. It should link the number of federal dollars big city governments get for infrastructure to the number of new homes completed. Money should flow after the keys are indoors. Pay for promises, get more promises. Pay for results, get results. The good news is we have examples of success. Look at the Squamish Nation and their development in Vancouver. They've approved and begun building on 6,000 apartments and condos on just 10.4 acres of land. That's nearly 600 homes per acre. Now they could do this because being a reserve, they did not need to follow Vancouver City Hall rules. That means 6,000 hardworking local residents will get a place to live because there were no city gatekeepers standing in the way. But let's bring this back. This isn't just about the price of a home. It is not just about numbers. This is people's lives. If we don't fix this, we could have hundreds of thousands of middle-class people living on the street in Canada. A home is your financial future. A home is the place you're secure. A home is where you raise a family. A home is at the center of everything you do in your life. If the government stands in the way of you getting a home, it stands in the way of your entire life going forward. The good news is, housing costs were not like this before Justin Trudeau, and they won't be like this after he's gone. We can borrow less and build more. We have all the natural advantages, abundant land, labor, and lumber. The best carpenters, plumbers, framers, 
and electricians and home builders. We just need to get the gatekeepers out of their way and yours so that we can bring it home. <laughs>